Hello, my name's uh, Chris McGrath. I'm here today to talk to you about our app, Care.com, which we have available in nine different languages, and talk about the lessons we learned doing that and the mistakes that we made, so hopefully you can avoid them. And I should kind of point out that it's human languages I'm talking about here, not computer languages. So, just in case anybody was confused. So, the talk will be in three parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about why we did it and how we did it and give some background. In the second part, I'm going to talk about the problems that we faced and the mistakes that we made and how we worked around those. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about the tools that, were, that are available or are not available and working with translators. And what I'm not going to cover in very much detail is the content that's already in the Rails guide, the IHN guide on Ruby, guides at rubyonrails.com. It's very well written. You can go and read it there, and it saves us going through a lot of uh, boring code. So I'm going to try and cover everything else around uh, having your site available in a number of different languages. And uh, it's, I've got quite a lot to go through, so I'd like it if we could leave questions, any questions to the end. So I work for a company called Portal 47. We have two products. One of them is Kiara.com, a property portal. That's the one I'm going to be talking about. That's the one that's in nine different languages. And the other one is something we're working at, at, the, min at, on, at the minute called Local App, which is still very much in development, but it's for managing Rails translations. So Kiero is a property portal similar to Rightmove or to Daft, but it's targeted at the expat market in Spain. It was started in 2003 as a PHP app, and it was just in English then. It's now a Rails 2.3 app, and it's in eight other languages. In 2007, we added Spanish, French, German, Danish, and Dutch. And in 2008, we added Italian, Portuguese, and Russian. So just a little bit of background about the site. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's for estate agents are the ones that give us the money. They pay, pay our wages, and they pay to advertise on the site. The main visitors to the site, the main users, are people who are looking to buy or rent property in Spain. So, the purpose of the site really is to start conversations between these people and the estate agents, so hopefully further down the line a sale can be made. So why do we have multiple languages? Well, for us, because it's advertising, it gives us a bigger reach, a bigger market. Uh, the more inquiries that we can send, the more conversations that are start, the more chances of a, a, a sale being made eventually. It, it helps buyers find sellers. If you have a Russian buyer who maybe speaks Spanish but not English, and an English seller who speaks, you know, doesn't speak Russian, it's a bit of a Rosetta Stone that they could find uh, if, if, they want, if the property was good for the Russian, he has a way of finding it, and the English seller has a way of, of finding the Russian buyer. So that's how it helps buyers and sellers. Uh, for, for state agents, it's a competitive advantage for them. The people who if they're trying to get a client, trying to get a property, they can point to the internet and say, look, we advertise in nine different languages, and our competitor down the street isn't going to do that, so you should, you should go with us. And we provide tools to help them translate the property descriptions, just standard stuff like close to beach or fitted kitchen into any of the languages. So that's the advantage for estate agents. Uh, the advantage for us is it's a unique selling point as well. None of our competitors do this, so it's something we can use when we're trying to find estate agents, and it, it works very well for us. So that's all I'm going to talk about, the, the kind of whys. How is, there's two steps to making your site available in a number of different languages. The first step is internationalization, and the second step is localization. I'm just going to define exactly what I mean by those so that we're all on the same page. So internationalization is the process of developing software that supports different languages, character sets, or sets of cultural dependencies without modifying the software. So what it's not is programming in a different language. It's not actually doing the translations themselves. It's using a set of tools to prepare your source code to be localized, which is the, the next step. So localization is the process of adapting software to support a specific language, character set, and cultural dependency. By cultural dependency there, I mean things like date formats, 
time formats, that kind of thing. And actually, language is a, is a bad term because what you're actually going to translate to is locales. And you can see the example here. It's locales are a combination of a region and a language. And you could maybe include, say, character encodings and things like that. But we've been happy enough with UTF-8, so we, we haven't needed any, any of that. So that's all the definitions I'm going to do. I'm just going to do a very brief, simple example of how you'd actually internationalize a site just so that when we go through the, the further problems, everybody at least knows the basics. So this is a very simple example. It's using the IATN NGEM, which is the default for Rails. And what you do is you replace the strings in your template here with calls to T, which is an alias to the translate method. And in the call to T, you put a key. And when that template comes to run, Based on the current locale, it will look up that key and pull whatever the, the correct translation is out. So that works very well. And if you've got a variable in your string like name here, then you pass it in as a hash with the key as the value. The, the default simple backend that ships with IATN, it uses YAML as the, the backend store. So you can see there uh, how the translations would look. You can see how the variables are going to work. It's the same syntax as uh, Ruby 1.9 strings. And you can see how it works in Spanish. And it's, it's very, it works pretty well. It's fairly easy to do. And it works very well for us. What I want to do is a bit of a side note here. I mentioned a main alternative, which is GetText. And GetText uses the base language as the key. So it uses the actual string as the key. And it uses printf style, percent %s variable substitution. So we, the original, uh, library that we used when we uh, internationalized the site first was globalized, and that used the same stuff. That used the base language as the key and percent %s uh, as the, the variable substitution mechanism. And we didn't really like that. It, we ran into problems with uh, you know, long sentences were just horrible for keys. And if we wanted to change the base language, the English text, then we had to go and find all the translations for that and fix them as well. And that was a, a bit of a pain. I'll show you a, an example later of why we don't like the percent %s variable substitution format as well. In a second. I'm not a big fan of the, the get text tools and the, the moment profiles and all that because I think they show their kind of C-based heritage and it's not, I don't like them. Your mileage might vary, you might, you might like them at all. Um, the reason people like get text over i18n, I've seen a few people comment on this, is really that they think that I18N is a, a bit too far, another level of indirection too far. But, so they want to see the text in the templates themselves. So you kind of have to decide yourself what, what's, what, what's going to work for you. And I think the actual tools that ship with Rails now are um, built on top of I18N, but I'm not actually completely sure about that. I haven't checked it out myself. But it's something to have a look at if, if you want to. So I'll just do the, the variable substitution example now. This is actually came from the site when we had globalize. So it was percent %s, percent %s, and percent %s, comma, percent %s. And if you're a translator, you know, how the hell do you work out what that means, or how, how, how do you translate that? So we much prefer the, the IATN syntax. You can see what the, the variable names are. And if you need to rearrange them, which you might well do, I'll show an example of that later, uh, you can do it very easily. And it's, if you're, going to hire a, a translator, you don't really, you're going to have more of a choice, I think, if you're using this style, because it's going to be easier to explain to people what to do. I think with, with get text, you can do rearranging, but you have to do like percent dollar two s, percent dollar one s, if you want to change the first and second variables around. So that's, that's why we don't like get text, but I thought I should really mention it for completeness. So the reasons we do like IHN, um, one of them is we do like that interaction. We do like the separation of the code from, from the content. And it makes it easier to, to reuse templates. We like that when you use dots and keys, it gives you automatic namespaces. So it's, it's namespaced. In, in the YAML, it turns it, it's basically nested hashes. So we like that um, because th that namespacing and those keys are, are important later when we talk about context and a translator being able to pick the right translation. 
So we also like that we can change the English language, our base language, and it will get, um, we don't have to go through and change all the other, find all the other uh, language translations and change those. And we, we also find it handy to use as a mini CMS. So we'll just have a little tiny key and then we'll have a lot of content that comes out of it. And that, that's worked very well for us. Um, one idea that I've had that we haven't done is to use it for A-B testing so that you can have a method that returns a key based on uh, a cookie or something in Redis, something like that there. And you can pull out the correct whatever strings you're using for your A-B testing then. And you can do that in a bunch of different languages. So that's just something that having the, that extra layer of indirection gives you. So that's all I'm going to talk about the, the kind of the how now, and I'm going to move on to, to problems. So when we did our in, original internationalization, we made a bunch of mistakes, and uh, I'm going to cover those now so that you can hopefully not avoid doing them uh, and, uh, and learn something useful. So this isn't an exhaustive list of problems by any stretch of the imagination, but it's the ones I'm going to cover today. So there's string concatenation, text and images, context, which is very important, gender, and large amounts of content. So I think these are the, the main problems that you'll have and probably cover like 80% of your, of your problems. So the first one is string concatenation, and it doesn't have to be concatenation, it can be interpolation. Anywhere that you're uh, put substituting strings into other strings or building them up. And we had this problem all over the site and uh, we had to change a lot of different places to, to make it work properly. And a good example, a simple example of why this is a problem is pagination. So this is a simple, you know, you've, you've all probably written the top line in that a few, few times in ERB. You've got two variables there, the page number and the total. And if you were kind of being very naive, you might think, well, I'm using page all over the site, so I'll translate that separately. I'm using off over the site, so I'll translate that separately. You probably wouldn't, you probably wouldn't think that, that, that badly, but it's a, an example of the kind of thing that can go wrong if you're uh, adding strings together or interpolating them. So with larger sentences, you, you do have a problem with that. So the, the reason this, this particular example is a problem is, is sentence order. Not all languages have the same sentence order as English. And in Japanese, for the, the, the total will come first. So you can see with the, with the bottom example there, there's no way you can actually make it make sense in Japanese. So this kind of thing is better done like this, where you use a key and you're passing in the variables. And then you can see easily there that you can rearrange it however it needs rearranged for the, for the target language. And that works very well, and, it, and it's easy. So I could go on for the rest of, of the talk talking about all the different ways that this can uh, mess you up. Instead, at the end, I'll give a list of links, and one of them is to an article called Text Fragmentation and Reuse in User Interfaces. And it basically goes through all the problems that you can have if you're naively substituting strings into sentences. And it's worth, well worth a read before you're, uh, you do any internationalization. So that's lesson one, which is the first lesson of Internationalization Club is don't concatenate strings. And the second le le lesson of Internationalization Club is also don't concatenate strings. So that was one problem we had. Another problem we had was, was text and images. It was the second mistake we made. Uh, Way back when, before we, before we started the internationalization process, we paid an external designer to do a very nice design for us. And this was before you know, modern browsers, really, so we had to have some text and images. And when we were doing that, we, this, when we were doing our internationalization, we, we suddenly thought, oh, well, that means we need two versions of all these images for each language that we have. And we weren't going to do that. It was just, a, it wasn't going to happen. So we basically had to redesign the entire site. It wasn't just text and images either. It was button backgrounds that were sized to the English text. And you can see, you can see here from this is the top nav bar on the site, you can see how much more space German takes up. English is actually one of the most comp compact languages. So in general, when you do your localization, it's going to take up more space. So it's, uh, it's something that we are, you know, are fixed with images didn't really handle. So we had to you know, do a whole redesign of the site, which was fun, you know. 
So that's one problem with, with text and images. Uh, another thing to do with design here is, is the space available and it's the length of the, the translations. It's important that your translators, whoever's doing your translations, can see uh, where the translation is going to be used. And I'll talk about that next when I'm talking about context. If, the, if, there's a, if the, the best word is a long word that's not going to fit, they need to be able to see it to, to know that they can put uh, an abbreviation or a shorter word, even if it's not the best translation, you know, something that's going to fit. So the example here is from the sites from our search drop down. And if you excuse my accent, in French, it's uh, Salon de Bain. And that's never going to fit in there. And Chris, who's our, our other developer, he does the French translations and a lot of, uh, he does the desi design as well. So he knew that SDB was what had to go in there. So that's lesson three. It's two lessons for the price of one. It's don't use text and images, which is a no-brainer these days anyway. And design for different text lengths. Make sure you can handle it. So the next thing I want to talk about is context. And it's, it's really the big one. It kind of underpins everything. It's, uh, it's something I've we touched on before. We've been able to see the translation in context to know what space is available and what, you, what words you can use there. It's important for the translator to be able to pick the right target language word. And it's a reason for having human translators rather than whacking stuff through Google Translate. A human translator can work out what's meant, you know, whereas uh, putting something through Google Translate, it doesn't know, A, how much space you have, and B, if there's a number of different phrases that it sends back to you, you don't really know which one to pick, which one's right. And a simple example of that is the word floor. We use this in a couple of places in the site, or we see it in a couple of places in the site. We see it in descriptions of properties. So we see uh, a wooden floor or marble floor, that kind of thing. And we see it in descriptions of apartment locations, like first floor, ground floor, top floor. That all works in English. You can use the word floor interchangeably there, and it's not a problem. In Spanish, as you can see here, there, there's two words that you can use, and the word for the floor of a room is suelo, and the word for the floor of a building is planta. So a translator, if they see floor in your translations that they're doing, they need to know the context to know which one to pick in, in Spanish. And that's just one very simple one word example. You have this problem all over the site, and, and with, with, any, with any kind of phrase, you know, the context really is important. Because as well, if a translator knows, can know the context and knows where it is, they can use their knowledge of, of both languages to, to make a, a, a translation that's of higher quality. So this is one of the reasons why we, liked, uh, we like the I18N keys. This is a bit of a contrived example. But it shows that if you were a translator and you saw the key was room.floor.type when you're translating into Spanish, you're going to be able to go, well, that's suelo. And if you see lift.panel.heading, you go, well, OK, that's planta. So that's one reason why we like keys. And ha having a good uh, schema for your key names is going to help your translators figure out the context. Another thing that can help is having a glossary. So if you were doing a flooring supply site, for example, and you're going to be using suelo everywhere, then you do a simple glossary for the translator that says, every time you see floor, use the word suelo. And okay, that's a very simple example, but if you have a very technical term that you need translated precisely, and you need it to be the same all over the site, then again, a glossary is, is something that you can use there, and it's, uh, it'll, it'll definitely help with context there. It's kind of a no-brainer that if you've got, uh, if you're doing ongoing translations, if you use the same translator, if they're doing enough work for you, it's good enough quality, keep using the same people, and then they'll know, they'll know what words you use on your site, and they'll know what space there is available in your layout, and they'll be able to pick what the good, you know, the good words and do good, good quality translations. So a kind of ideal that I have for the app we're developing is on-page translations. And this example here is from another app called chufnik.com. 
So it's a web app that runs in uh, kind of translator mode. You can see the words in context. You can click on them. You can type in the translation. And you press return. And in my ideal solution, you know, that gets sent off to our app and then magically appears in your, in your Reels YAML files or whatever your back end is. And you can see how this really um, solves the context problem. You know, you can see stuff on the page where it's used. You can, you can uh, see what space is available. And it, it really is an ideal of, uh, of uh, the kind of interface that we'd like to have, I think. So this is it's something that isn't probably immediately obvious when you're talking about internationalization and localization, but context really is important. If you're going to, you know your site, you know what words are used where. A translator is coming in generally cold, so you need to have some way of helping them uh, find out what the context is so they can do good translations. So that's lesson four, which is make sure that your translators can understand context and, and, and find out where stuff's being used. So the next problem we had on the site was gender. And it's uh, the biggest problem kind of we had after context. And because we use English as a base language, and in English you don't generally have to change the other words in a sentence depending on, on what noun you're using. Uh, with other languages you do, uh, French obviously being the example. And a good example of where we have this on the site is property types. We have like 10 different property types. And we have a, a number of adjectives that we put together with those. And that works OK in English, uh, but it doesn't work in French. I'll show you an example in, in a second. There's, there's two real kind of solutions to this. One is to try and have a, uh, a key for each combination of locale, of, sorry, noun and adjective. And the other is to try and rearrange the sentence to, to get around the problem. So different keys works best because the translator can pick the exact right language to use. Uh, but obviously, if you've got too much of uh, if you've got too many combinations, it's going to be a combinatorial explosion, and it's not going to really work. So the example I'm going to show you is for um, I'm not going to show you all ten property types. I'm going to pick three, which is apartments, villas, and townhouses. So this is how you might start off doing it. And that works OK in English. You can have a luxury villa. You can have a luxury townhouse, luxury uh, um, apartment. That's all fine. That works. But you can't translate that into French, because in French, you have to use luxueux or luxueuse, depending on the type of the property. So the way, the way around it is to build up your key dynamically. I've just shown a dot .key method here. You could use uh, tableize and rails or some, something. <laughs> to generate your, your keys. And that, you can see then from the translations, that's all going to work, and that the French is, is using Luxue and Luxue's properly. And that's great. And it's, uh, it's manageable for us. We have like 10 property types and eight adjectives that we combine them with. And not all of them combine. You don't have new land or luxury commercial property. So it's just about manageable. But when you have more or you have uh, uh, words combined in a sentence, it's not really going to work. So back to uh, our, this was the original percent s, percent s, and percent s, comma, percent s, complex sentence. And it's actually a bad sentence anyway to translate, because it's, even, in, even with having the variable names, it doesn't really help, because it's, uh, you're not going to be able to use, do the gender correctly in different languages. And it's a, you can see it's a substitution problem as well, concatenating things together, basically. So the actual example, where this is from, it's from the RSS feed title in our site. So when you do a search for a specific set of criteria, you can get an RSS feed of the results. And every time you refresh it in the browser, if there's any new properties, they come up. So it's not hugely used part of the site. People who know RSS use it. But it's, it's, um, it's not important but it is something we want to keep around. So if we wanted to have a key for every combination in this sentence, we've, we've 10 property types. There's four payment schemes. We have five location levels, which change the text as well. And we have uh, adjectives like coastal and inland. And I worked it all out. And depending on how many of those we wanted to use, there's between 40 and 320 combinations. 
And for uh, RSS property feed title, we're not going to translate it 320 times or even 40 times in nine different languages on the site. It's just not going to happen. Like, it's not going to do it. So the way we worked around it was to realize, well, it's a, it's a title. It doesn't really need to be a sentence as such. So we can rearrange it. And this avoids the problem, and it's, easier, it's actually easier to scan in your feed reader. So it's plural property name dash payment scheme title dash location name. And that worked in this example because we could turn it into a, a list. And when Chris was doing the French translations, that's how he works around a lot of the gender problems that we have um, by just essentially making things less of a sentence. So that works OK for us. It's not ideal, but it's, it's good enough for us at, at the moment anyway. If we wanted actual French, uh, proper French sentences, then we're going to have to look at another solution for that. Um, one thing I came across when I was researching this on GitHub was a library called Genderize. And that um, had a way of having your translations, having your genders in the actual string, so you didn't need you know, 10 or 20 strings or however many combinations you needed. So that actually only had, it supported masculine and feminine which is fine for French and Spanish, but it's not going to work for German because that has three genders. It is neuter as well. And then Swahili actually has eight genders, I found out. And uh, Cantonese has one, thankfully. So that's, that's easy enough. So that's really the, the next lesson, is to try and avoid complicated sentences. Uh, in, it's, a, I suppose, a general principle anyway of not having big flowery prose on your site, but the less there is there to translate, the easier it's going to be to translate. So that's lesson five. The, the next lesson is, uh, or the next thing I want to talk about is large blocks of content. And that's it's things like emails and um, terms and conditions and help, that kind of thing. And the first mistake we made when we did this was we went through our templates and we translated each individual sentence on their own. And that ends up being a, a concatenation problem as well as a context problem. So it didn't really work. So the second thing we did was we, um, the original Globalize and Rails now supports having the locale in the template name. So if your current locale is, is Spain ES and you have a .es.html.erb, it will pick up that template and use it instead of the base language key one. So that is OK, and it, it kind of works. But the problem we have then is, is getting the content that's in our files to the translators. The, we use Haml, so we don't really want to have to explain Haml and keeping indentation right and all that to the actual translators. We don't want to have to give them access to our source code. And if you're a developer and you're saying to yourself, well, I have to copy this template nine times, obviously warning bells are going off in your head going, well, I have to change it in one place, then I'm going to have to change it in all those other places. So we're not entirely happy with that solution at the minute. And what we'll move towards is, is using, key, using uh, it like a keys like a mini CMS where we'll have the content in our, in our actual tool itself that we're using to manage translations. So it's... One thing it does do is it keeps all these big blocks of content out of your YAML file. And you don't really want to be hand editing YAML files, uh, especially not if it's all this kind of, you know, you're trying to keep a template and code formatted and it, YAML formatted as well. It's just a nightmare. So you want to avoid that. So you have to kind of think of the workflow of how you're going to get uh, the large blocks of content backwards and forwards between you and your translators. So that's, that's lesson six. And that's really um, the, the lessons that I want to talk about. The, the, um, there's, there's other ones. I can, you, if you come and talk to me uh, after, I can tell you lots of little war stories about, about doing it. Uh, next, I want to talk for, for a while about the tools. This is the third part of the talk. So I18N doesn't have anything built in unless you count hand editing YAML files as has been built in. And we've always ended up building our own uh, solutions to do that, to, to handle our translations. And I'm going to explain kind of what the problems that we want solved are to show you why that we've, we've always ended up with our own. So the, the, the main thing that we do is when we launch a feature, we just launch it in English first. And then it, you know, so and we use fallback. So for a while, all the other sites have, the Spanish site has some English in it until we 
do the translations and approve them. And when we were on Rails 2 and Globalize 1, we'd, uh, we built something on top of that, which was we put the translations at the bottom of the page by monkey patching Globalize. And we ran a dev mode listener against our production database and then give the translators access to it. And they could type in the translations. And then we, when we were happy with them, we'd just restart the production listeners and the site would be, all the English would go and it would be in Spanish or whatever language. So that worked okay for us. It wasn't perfect. Uh, and we had a list of things that we'd like to do you know, better, but it was good enough that the effort required to do all the extra work wasn't really worth it. So you know, we still had a list of problems, but there was, it was the all lower priority than other stuff we wanted to do on the site. So when we upgraded to Rails 2.3 and to the IHN NGM, we had to throw all that away. And it wasn't a problem to start with because we wrote another tool to a one-off throwaway thing to port our translations from Globalize's database, pull them out of the database and put them in YAML files and put the keys into the, to our source code. And that worked okay, it wasn't very pretty, uh, but eventually it worked. And we had our old site back as it were and all the translations in YAML. So that was fine, but there was nothing really for us to to, to work with, with new translations for new features. Um, we kind of looked around to see what was av available at the time. The first thing we looked at was an open source thing called Talk, which is 37 signals uh, use. And that was, that you still have to hand edit the, your English YAML files in the base language. So that didn't really work for us. And there's, there's a few older ones that I've noticed over the years, but they don't seem to be maintained. If, if you can have a look around GitHub for some of these things. Uh, so we didn't really see a solution in open source. So we looked around uh, for um, other basic software as a service style solutions, and there's a, a few different ones. There's Magengo, WordChuck, 99 Translations, Web Translator, and the one we're, we're building ourselves. Some of those we'd seen before we made the decision to build our own, and some of them we'd seen after. Uh, I'm not going to do a feature comparison or anything now, but uh, most of them didn't really do what we wanted. There was too many manual steps or just something that we didn't like doing. So to explain that a little bit, I'm going to talk about just kind of three big requirements that we have for, for a tool, the three main problems we want to solve. So I've, I've talked about um, fallback, and the IT and NGM actually provides a, a fallback backend you can use. Uh, it's very easy to use. So that's, that's fine. The, we want it to, to fit into our development process. And what, what I mean by that is we don't want to be having to do uh, very much outside how we normally develop code. And we definitely don't want to be doing any hand copying and pasting YAML around or any of that. And we don't want to be having to run scripts to sync translations down. Uh, we want it to work very smoothly. And as a kind of touched on before, we want it to be usable by translators with no technical knowledge. Uh, we're a distributed company, so it's, it has to be a web app. Um, but most of you know, our, so our translators are all over the place as well, and we don't, they have to be able to use it easily. We don't want to have to explain Rails to them or to explain Haml, you know, that kind of thing. So I've talked about the first one already. I'll talk about our development process. We use um, the Git flow model. So we'll develop features on a feature branch. Where, when we're finished with those, we'll uh, merge them into our develop branch. When we've got enough stuff on the develop branch and we're happy that it checks out on stage, we will uh, do a release to the master branch and then deploy that to the site. So that works fine. And the problem that we have to solve with this is that when you're developing a new feature, you're going to add some keys. You're probably going to remove some keys. And you're also going to have updated some, a key that's on the live site. So what you don't want is to be changing translations in your whatever tool you're using to manage translations and having that break the live site because you haven't deployed a feature yet. So that's, so we need some way of basically blocking uh, certain translations from, from being sent to our live site to avoid that until we are, we've done the, the right deploy. But that kind of, that, uh, conflicts with the other uh, requirement that we want, which is that when we've deployed a feature in English, when the translators do their translations and we, uh, and we are happy with them, we approve them, 
we want that to automatically go to the live site without, having, without us having to do anything. So there's two kind of conflicting requirements there. We've, we haven't quite solved it with our app yet. Uh, it's the next thing we're doing. And we've got a, like we, we think we've worked out how to do it technically. Um, but the hardest thing is really the, the user interface to make sure you don't either have fields of checkboxes or um, lots of confusing stuff on, on the page that you don't use all the time. We're, we're, this is something we want to use ourselves. We're pretty confident we can make it kind of smooth and make it fit in with what we want to be doing. So those are really um, like business requirements and developer requirements. Uh, for the translators themselves, there, there's two sides to it really. The one side is, well, finding them, which I'll talk about next, um, but managing them, seeing what their progress is and doing a translations, uh, approving translations, that kind of thing. That's all standard web app stuff, so it's not that interesting really. Um, for, for the translators doing the, the translations themselves, I've said, you know, the ideal is for them to be able to just look at the page they're translating and type it into that web page. That's not something we very many people have, very many tools have. So we want to add in other ways of, of um, helping a translator find context, like you know, where, where specific keys were used, what, what URLs, what paths, uh, what routes even maybe. So that's a bit about tools. It's, it's a changing landscape. I, I, there's a lot of uh, different requirements because it really depends on, on how your development process works and whether you're happy releasing you know, English versions first and having it fall back. If you weren't, then you might not have the same requirements as us. So I think that there'd be more solutions over time. Um, but that's, that's lesson seven. You think about what the requirements are and make sure that the tools you pick and the tools you use fit into your development process. So next, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about uh, finding translators. So the important things to think about when you're, when you're going to go and try and hire some translators is how good quality you want. That's one thing. You need to kind of have an idea of how many locales you're, you're translating into. Is it just two or is it 20? Because that will affect your decision. Is it ongoing? Are you, is it you're, you're going to be developing this site like, like we are and you need ongoing translation work done? Or is it just a one-off? Uh, the most important thing is obviously budget, how much money you have to spend on all this. So, there are different types of translators, and you, which one you might pick really depends on your answers to those, those questions. Obviously, if you can speak all the languages yourself and you're happy handed in the YAML, you can just go and do it. You might have friends or colleagues who can speak uh, multiple languages, and they'll help you out. You might want to hire a freelancer, and there's the website that they all hang out on is proz.com, P-R-O-Z. So you can go there and I think pretty much find a, tran a translator for any language you want. There are translation companies, uh, and I'll talk about them in a second. You could do machine translation in Google Translate as long as you're you know, happy that people might laugh at your translations you know, as you laugh at at when Google Translate does English ones for you. So, and the other thing you can do is try is crowdsource translations. And there's two real ways, you know, if you're big enough, like Facebook or GitHub, you know, crowdsource translations can work. Or if you're small, but you're prepared to be patient and find a customer who wants it in their own language and will do it for you, that could be a way of doing it as well. So you have to decide kind of where you are in this made up graph here. Uh, the LSPs are, are translation companies. They are language service providers. And they're kind of traditional kind of enterprise companies that the kind of people you'd hire if you wanted a, a printer manual translated into 50 different languages. And we, we looked at those when we were looking at tools, and they wanted like $10,000 up front and us to be spending $3,000 a month with them. So really, it was kind of out of our league, and they weren't interested us, in us below that. So I think a lot of people here are going to be you know, not wanting to spend that much money on, on having translations done. So kind of software as a service solution is, a, is another um, is probably what's going to work best for kind of Rails and Ruby applications, I think. 
And like I said, you know, keep an eye on what tools are out there because uh, it's, it's a changing landscape. If uh, when we don't have freelancers on that slide, but if you're if you hire a freelancer, um, a lot of them use a system called Trados, and it basically is you, you can send them if you're doing a one-off project, you send them a text file full of strings, they'll import them into Trados, do their thing, and send it back to you translated, and that could work very well if you're if you are doing a one-off thing. And the way they tend to work to um, what that software gives them is a, it's called a translation memory. So every translation they've ever done is stored in there. So when they get your file, they'll just run it through that, see what matches, and then make sure that it, it works. So it's faster for them, but translators tend to get paid by the word anyway, so them being faster helps them, and it doesn't really help you very much apart from having faster translations. So that's the lesson eight. Um, think about sourcing your translators before you start. So assuming you have started and you've localized the site and you don't speak the target language, you're going to have to think about how you do some quality control on it. So the highest quality we have on our site is in English and in Spanish. And we have people who can speak English and Spanish and, and we can work that out. The others aren't quite as good because our English and Spanish are our main traffic, so that's the ones we concentrate on. We'd, we'd like to improve them. But there's a, there's a cost-benefit ratio there. And we're kind of happy enough with lower quality for them. It's important that we say, you know, we have the site in nine different languages. It's not quite as important that those be very good translations. So with Russian, we, um, how do we know that's good or that's good? None of us speak Russian. None of us read Cyrillic. So what, what can we do to, to figure out if that's even in the right ballpark as a translation? And one thing, the first thing you can try is just running it through Google Translate backwards, you know, just to check that it's roughly right. Uh, that's just you know, a, a quick sanity check. If you're not, you can hire another translator for that language separate to the person who's actually doing the translations to do QA for you, just to make sure it's right. And when you, if you hire a, a learning service provider, a language service provider, sorry. That's part of what you're paying the extra cost for is they will have a team of people and some of them will do the translations and some of them will check them for quality. And the last thing you can do is just wait for people to complain and, and, and see uh, and change it then. So it is important to check quality though because this example here is from the, um, the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is a Guardian article about this not so long ago. And they were doing the English version of their site and they were translating the Institute of Protein Research, which is the Institute Belka. And Belka is also the Russian word for squirrel. So on their site, they have the Squirrel Institute. <laughs> so it's important that you have like, at least some way of checking that it's roughly in the right ballpark. So that's the, the final lesson, is check translation quality. So that's all my lessons. I'm just going to sum up before taking some questions. So if you know you're going to be localizing your site, internationalize it from day one. It's a lot easier uh, when it's done that way. And you might get some side benefits out of having your, that layer of indirection between, in, between your templates and the actual content. Think hard about what quality level you need. Does it need to be perfect or not? Um, the it and gem is not designed to do everything for everybody but it's designed that you can build on it quite easily. It's got a fairly simple API. So um, you might have to do that. If you're doing something that is, is not covered by it, you might have to write some code yourself or see if somebody else has done it. The, like I said, this is the third time I'm saying this thing, but keep an eye on the tools and what's around and what's available. Uh, they're getting better, they're improving all the time, and hopefully we'll build a good one you know, that you'll want to use. And lastly is, of course, don't use string concatenation. So if you don't remember anything else, remember locale app and don't use string concatenation. So all the links I've talked about will be up at blog.localapp.com. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks for having me speak. And if you've got any questions, I'll answer them now. Yep. Yep.
Yeah. But if you're able to speak two languages, just start with one, don't you two at the same time, because that really is everything up. Yeah. I mean, it really slows you down. Yes. If you throw everything away and start with fresh, it's really... So it's, 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 it's not actually a, it's not a question, it's a war story, but which is don't, uh, if you're internationalizing, just do one language first and do it from the start because we had to do this. We had to go through all the templates put when we were changing to I18N, pulling all the text out and replacing it with keys. And it was just, you know, there, we had a couple of thousand different keys. It was horrible. It's, it's done now. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah. Actually, questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we just basically, we, we launch a feature and it's in English and it will appear in English on the Spanish site and on the French site and on the Russian site until we've done the translations. So we're happy enough that no, you know, nobody's really going to complain or if they do complain, it's only going to be for a couple of days until we have the translations done. So it's just the simplest thing to do. We, we don't have to. And then it also means that uh, we can work out the bugs in the English version first and um, we don't have to wait for all these translators all around the world to, to have everything translated. So, yeah. Um, your presentation talks a lot about um, language translation. Yeah. In terms of internationalization, mm -hmm. obviously countries have different functional yeah. requirements. Yeah. Right. Do you mean functional requirements? I'm not sure what you mean. When I say functional requirements, so, you know, in terms of internationalizing, you can create instances right. to different countries. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the, so the question is about having multiple code bases or one code base, and that's really um, the, in the definition of internationalization is making your source code, so, um, using tools to make the source code work in all different localizations. So you only ever have one source code. You don't, don't ever have two versions. Don't like start another branch for French. You're, you're dead if you do that. Dave? Uh, well, the agents can submit, um, if they submit like a feed to us, uh, they can put, they can use, like most of their systems have little check boxes for near beach, that kind of stuff. And they send that through in the feed and we automatically translate that. And we also give them tools if they just want, if they just want to type in the, the text to do that. So um, we don't, we, that's something we'll probably offer down further down the line is, is doing automatic translations, that kind of thing. Yes. So, Uh, so the question is, do we put markup in the translations? And the answer is yes, we do in some places. Um, yeah, in general they are. I mean, most of them, especially ones that are doing web translations, are okay with HTML and probably even ERB if we wanted to use that because they're probably used to translating PHP apps as well. So they're generally okay with a little bit of technology. Right. Um, we don't at the minute. We use the sub. We use subdomains to decide on what the locale is. So es.kiero.com or u.kiero.com. Our routes are all in English. And then what we do when you do a search, we don't have a query string. We have like a, a basically it's a browse code. It's just a little code that's is basically all the search parameters squished together. And we we put localized text after that um, based on what the code is. <coughs> Okay, I think that's my time up. So thank you very much. And uh, I can drink tonight now. <laughs>